Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the 401 Access Denied podcast. I'm the host of the show, Joe Carson, and it is a pleasure to be here with you. We're always looking to bring exciting topics and amazing guests. And today we have the awesome Jason Haddix with us. So, Jason, over to you to give the guests a bit of an introduction, who you are and what you get up to. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Joe. Um, so uh, my name is Jason Haddix. I am a currently a CISO and hacker in charge at a company called Buttobot. We do adversarial emulation, simulation, and Red Team as a service. So um, a lot of hacking stuff. Um, formerly, I was the CISO of uh, Ubisoft, which is a multinational video game company. They make games like Assassin's Creed and Just Dance and The Division and all that kinds of stuff. Um, and before that, I had kind of been in offensive security in different sections of the world, uh, different different sections of the community uh, for about 12 years, I would say. So a um, little bit of leadership, mostly a lot of hacking and trying to marry the two together these days. So well, it's really important to, to be able to to bring those both together, because for organizations today, you really need to you know to be, be defensive and be yeah. able to be resilient. You need to understand the techniques that you know attackers use. Yes, and the more you correct. understand those techniques, the better you can actually implement the right controls. Um, so tell, tell me a bit about how did you get into the industry? Um, you know, and uh, what was some of the what was some of the interesting things and, and passion and things that got you excited? Uh, where did it all start for you? Yeah, so um, I've always been kind of a hustler, I, I guess you could say, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and very nerdy and into computers when I was. When I was in my early um, gr or late grade school years, I taught myself HTML because mm -hmm. I found a book um, at my library and it was like, you can make web pages. So like, you know, I started there and then um, really did like a whole bunch of stuff. Like um, I hacked direct TV satellites for a while. Um, I, uh, I did a whole bunch of stuff. And then eventually I hacked Xboxes. And then eventually when I was in my early twenties, my, um, my, all my friends were older than me. And so they wanted to go out to the bars and you have to be 21 here <laughs> in the States. And I was, um, I was 19 about to hit 20. And so I couldn't go out with them. And it was a point of frustration for me. And so uh, I found one of my friends at my college and I was like, uh, he was like, Hey, I can get you a fake ID. So I was like, okay. Um, so I paid back then, which was like an absorbent amount of money for a college student, $110 for an ID. Um, and when it came back a month later, uh, it was the worst fake ID I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> and um, and so, you know, there's no returning a fake ID and I tried to use it and it got confiscated at one of the bars and I didn't get in trouble or anything like that. But it did kind of make me a little angry. And I was like, I think I could I could probably do better, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I went searching for, you know, like communities or like tutorials on how to do that. And back then the internet was a different place, right? And so there was only a few communities that even offered anything like that. And um, one of them was Counterfeit Library and the other one was Shadow Crew um, and some of the other precursor to what the dark web is today, forums. Yeah. So I fell into that forum ecosystem and it definitely makes you feel like you have a community, right, of people supporting you. And I got really into it and started making really good um, IDs. Um, you know, things like, uh, you know, printing on Tesla, Tesla and laminating, um, you know, building holograms using, um, Pearl X, you know, uh, hacking printer cartridges to make UV, you know, small DPI UV holograms look the right colors so that they pass into the black light, encoding, you know, three track mag strips, like all that stuff. So I had all the gear and you, um, got, you, got, you got into the real professionals. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't do anything halfway. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So I got into it, but um, really I was only making a couple of fake IDs mm -hmm. for my, my friends. Right. Yeah. And then um, like a year and a half into that, um, you know, uh, Shadow Crew, the main forum that was kind of the first ecosystem that was more mainstream, got busted by the Secret Service. Yeah. And um, the Secret Service and a whole bunch of law enforcement agencies across the world came and swooped in and um, basically uh, took down Shadow Crew, arrested a whole bunch of the administrators. Um, it was a big, big bust. And it was the first of its kind. It was the first that... Um, they had busted a forum ecosystem like that. And so um, that was the precursor to the dark web, um, but it scared the crap out of me. I remember the day that it happened, they put up a page, they put up on the front page of the forum, um, a picture of a dude behind bars and the front page of the forum said, mm -hmm. we're coming for you all. So, you know, I threw all my printers, my laminates, everything <laughs> into the back of my sea green civic and, um, 
and threw it in a black trash bag into my uh, in the back of my car. I don't know why I didn't put it in my trunk because that would have been smarter. But um, put it in the back seat of my car, drove a few towns away, and put it in a dumpster and burned it all. Um, and um, and so it really scared the crap out of me. And so like you know things went on for a little while. You know I remember calling my girlfriend and saying, hey, you know I might you know like it was it was a good run. You know like <laughs> if uh, if I don't see you, you know. Uh, and then, uh, you know, things went on and I was in community college, so uh, junior college, and um, I was in the Cisco networking program and there was a new elective that was offered that year called ethical hacking and network defense. And I was like, I had that's, hung out. Yeah. That's impressive to be, be that was, that's yeah ahead of its time. Uh, way ahead of its time. <laughs> like not many, not many <laughs> colleges were offering that, honestly. Yeah. Um, and so I had hung out with a lot of the hackers on the forums, right? Because the ecosystem of the, of those forums is the hackers who provide the dumps and the hacked credit card numbers. There is the ID makers, and then there is the fake credit card makers. Yeah. Um, and so they each have a role to play. The ID makers make the IDs so that the credit card people can encode them and mm -hmm. dump them, and they have to load the credit card numbers from the hackers. And so it's a, it's a three-way kind of cyclical ecosystem um in at least for for carding it is and so i knew a lot of the hackers and they had showed me some like stuff mostly early web hacking sql injection cross-site scripting this was like mm -hmm. when that stuff was first coming out a lot of local file includes um rce and php apps and stuff like that mm -hmm. and um and so when i took this course at my college i told my instructor angel i'm like hey man the stuff you're teaching is like already like really old it's not current um even the stuff in the book is like, you know, back orifice and, you know, that, that, that was a while ago, you know, That's like, a long in, time ago. yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, and so I talked with them for a little while and obviously I was doing really well in the course and I did, uh, I think I did a guest lecture too on kind of modern web app hacking, which nobody was talking about. And he was like, you know, you can do this for a living, right? And I was like, um, not really. And he's like, our next module talks about the career of penetration testing. And I was like, yeah. I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, yeah, like you get paid a lot of money for breaking into companies and, and then showing them how you did it so that they can secure their websites and their networks. And I was like, that sounds awesome. Um, I want to <laughs> do that. And so from that moment, I, I finally found my purpose, right? Like, and that had, and that basically drove me for, you know, the next 12, 13 years. Um, and I taught myself, I was doing help desk work at the time, um, part time. And it was a night gig. So I had time to teach myself. Uh, and I begged, borrowed, and stole every training I could get my hands on, mm -hmm. every tutorial, every blog I read, um, and was just teaching myself how to, how to test, how to do vulnerability analysis, uh, vulnerability scanning, and then exploitation, and then moved on to you know, more web hacking, and then mobile hacking. And um, yeah. And so that was the very beginning of it. You know, I, I definitely landed my first security job. Mm -hmm. um, later, but, um, and then moved on from company to company. But, um, yeah, I've been at HP. I've been at, um, Redspin was the first small one I was at. I think, I think you yeah. started at HP not long after I left. <laughs> yes. No, it was, it was after you left. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it's been a, it's been a great career. I, I can't imagine being anywhere else, honestly. So it's, it's impressive though. One of the things that, you know, always interesting, you know, uh, I've had a couple of moments in my career that as well, that you find something that, you know, that the light bulb comes on and yeah. you get really excited about it and you realize that it's, 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 you're calling, it's the one thing yeah. that gets you so excited. Uh, yeah. Cause even I remember two, two moments in my career where it was deciding what to study at university mm -hmm. uh, in college. And I was like, okay, I was good at a few things, but it was my passion and love of gaming then yep. that drove me into, into computer science. Yep. Um, and that was the thing that was the, the decision making. And so when you're talking about IDs, one of the things I just always get this funny memory. I remember uh, going back to, cause I, I, I didn't have a lot of money when I was younger and so, you know, always had to try and save and, 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 and try to get things uh, where I possibly could. Yep. Now, that time was cassette tapes were, or where right. games were delivered because cassette tapes and cartridges. Yep. Um, and and floppy disks with the kind of, so and cassette tapes. I used to remember sitting having to cut the skin because they came and they had the protected uh, magic bits of the, the part yep. at the beginning. Yep. And in order to play, you had to get your your, your uh, scissors out. You had to cut the tape. You had to basically yep. sell tape it on in order to make it at the right moment so yep. that game would play. And that was yep. some of the things that you know. That's how I got uh, you know the games that I wanted to play that I just didn't didn't have the money. 
market. Game, game um, hacking is such an in for so many people I talk to yeah. in this industry. Um, the fact that they just got a little bit of their technical skill in reverse engineering mm -hmm. or whatever, it all started from them wanting to pirate some game or yeah. um, cheat some game or something like that. And then that that kind of snowballs into other things. Yeah, it was literally the, it was gaming and, and access yeah. to the software. As yeah, well. you know, those oh, yeah. were the things that kind of, and, and that was, you know, throughout the nineties and early two thousands, that was a lot of the motivations. Yeah, there was the yeah. second moment, the second moment, you know, because that that got me into IT, not necessarily mm -hmm. security. Security was when I was doing it; it was always it was just something extra that you did on top of your yeah. day job. Yeah. Um, you know, security when I started was a key to the door and the password to the computer. Yeah, it was literally yeah. that was that was it. <laughs> that was the, the mm -hmm. basis of security. Yep. Um, but then there was a moment, it was in 2000, I wasn't remember, it was 2002, and it was the GRC.com. So I was responsible for a NOC, okay. uh, Network Operations Center. And at that time, uh, Steve Gibson, who basically was his company, GRC.com, mm -hmm. became the uh, the attack of a, a, DDoS, a DDoS attack. Mm -hmm. And I, my company, I was at the time, used the same service provider. So we okay. became a secondary victim. And ah, okay. it was that investigation that, that Steve Gibson did. And I was also looking into logs and was sharing and looking mm. at the event. It was that event, you know, being a secondary victim yep. of a DDoS yep. attack that yep. then got me excited about there's more that I can learn here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what really took me in the path of getting into in security. Okay. Uh, so it's, those right. some of the defining moments that really, you know, sometimes sets you off. And it's really important to find that, but to find yeah. what it is that excites you. Yeah. So going going into that, you you kind of then you know looked in the industry. Um, what were some of the kind of you know the early penetration tests or the early bug bites and stuff that you got involved into? Was there any any lessons learned from those uh, that uh, you had? Yeah, I mean, um, so I went on to do a lot of like back then it was a lot of network, right? I mean, the thing that mm -hmm. people were purchasing in those early days was network pen tests and um, externals and internals. So um, you know they would give you an IP range. And that was still in the day where you could have service-based exploits, right? So mm -hmm. um, you could pop SSH or you could pop some FTP or something like that. It's not, it was a very different world than it is now. And so I, I, you know, got my chops during the time where we transitioned from that stuff kind of getting a little bit more secure. Mm -hmm. And then the web being, you know, going through the dot-com bubble and the web being kind of crazy. And then web vulnerabilities being the primary, you know, um, issue. And so I got to grow up and, and be trained during that time. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely learned a lot about, I mean, my whole whole career has been, you know, um, lessons in, um, that, I, that I didn't know I was taking as lessons in security strategy, right? <laughs> um, as an offensive practitioner, you, you are a consultant and you see so many companies, right? I would say that at this point I've worked for, maybe 90% of the fortune 100 uh, as a consultant at, at one of yeah. my companies. Um, and you get to see, and you get exposure to their issues and their problems. And, you know, despite size and scale, they're all, they all have very much the same issues, right? It's, um, it's shadow IT. They all end up, you know, after a certain point, they have shadow IT and they have configuration issues and they have AppSec issues. And, um, you know, a new technology comes out and they, uh, you know, the business wants to adopt it and then um, it to make money and then IT lags behind and then security lags behind that. And then so you're playing catch up for, you know, the new technologies. You know, right now you could consider AI is going to be the next thing for that. But before mm -hmm. it was mobile apps and, you know, before that it was web services and, um, you know, things like that. So uh, definitely I've learned a lot. Um, as far as testing goes, you know, I think the one thing I've learned uh that's really important is that the test is only 50 percent of that job right a lot of people want to go into it <laughs> and they, they they love the idea of the hacker job yes. but the other half half of your time is spent reporting and presenting um and so that means that not only do you have to be a good writer but you also have to be able to communicate your findings to a customer about why they matter and um, I like that a lot more people are talking about this nowadays, right? I think the extension of this nowadays, since many people do have decent reports and can present on them is um, instead of uh, the, the saying is showing up and throwing up, right? When you're um, an assessment person, offensive assessment, you know, auditor, whatever you are, right? Is trying to help the organization because they're underwater. They are, they are absolutely swimming in 8 million things they could do. Everybody has vulnerabilities. You're not going into a place telling them anything they really don't know. They knew they were going to have, they were going to have vulnerabilities. Um, yep. 
very few organizations are going to be like that org that just doesn't have any findings right i've only had that a few times in my whole career um and so you know these days it's, it's it goes beyond um just giving them vulnerabilities in a report and a presentation it now i i want to see our assessment industry grow to give defensive and um, and better remediation advice right so if it's appsec let's give them some easy to implement libraries that solve the problems that they have, right? Because developers know how to do that. If it's, you know, detection, let's give them open source Yara or Suricata rules or, um, you know, or Sigma rules or something like that, or Splunk queries they can prioritize or Windows configurations that'll make this thing easy, right? I want to see the next generation of help for organizations go a little bit deeper than what we've been doing so far. And so that's that's kind of what I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to build right now with my team um, at Autobot is um, is yeah. better reporting and, and better presentation and add a little bit more purple to to the red. So absolutely. I think that's one of the one of the important things we've learned over the years is that, uh, you know, we you know defensive side of things is really important, but mm -hmm. it's important that it merges and actually collaborates with the defensive team yeah. to show yeah. them what things they can do in order to, you know, let's say, uh, put the right controls in place. And they're also yeah. the right prioritizations because a lot of times, and I think that's why really in purple, purple teaming is so critical because mm -hmm. it should be something that you'd be doing ongoing. Yeah. Um, I think going even further into the reporting side of things, it also gets important to be able to convert that into the business language. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the things I'm advocating right now is, is we need to start transitioning from talking about cybersecurity in a silo mm -hmm. to talking more about how it actually should map to the business security. Yep. Um, ultimately how yep. it maps to the business services yep. and what's the priority of those business services. And yep. you're absolutely one of, you brought up an important topic is that, you know, a lot, the media does portray this as a very, <laughs> uh, you know, hands-on keyboard all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of the times the reporting skills and the writing skills becomes yeah. an essential part of the skill set. It does. Yeah. And then being yeah. able to translate that into uh, things that the business understands. Yep. is also another skill set that you know is definitely uh you know getting enhanced further and improved uh, one of the reporting is so critical in our area i mean yeah it's 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 um reporting and then um if you're going to be on the leadership side presenting to mm -hmm. like you know is i think is also really important one of the things i was going to say is that um you know one of the lessons i learned recently from being a CISO at a very large organization like ubisoft was mm -hmm. um I actually thought about security, um, I would say wrong for a majority of my career. And I was on that side where mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about the business impact. I mean, I was from a point of a, a hacker point of view, like, like I wasn't yeah. having any trouble explaining that a vulnerability was critical because of X, Y reason or because it affected X crown jewels. But one of the things I learned at Ubisoft after being the target of several um, real threat actor campaigns um, was that actually the biggest risk to the business and the most expensive cost to the business is uh, is not actually vulnerabilities or, or it really doesn't have anything to do with AppSec, actually, it's downtime. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when we faced threat actors that took our network down and our services down, we lost a lot of money. And um, and that was the worst thing that ever happened to us um, by by miles, right? And so I feel like, you know, a lot of people they asked this question, we're stuck in kind of the, um, this dance of, you know, what we do every year. It's like, oh, we get a pen test, we get some AppSec assessment, we have some stuff and we're that's answering Tuesday. the- That's Tuesday. <laughs> we gotta yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we're so, you're so stuck as an industry and in like, in like keeping that going. Um, I don't feel like a lot of people are asking the right questions of like, instead of like, can I be tested? Because everybody can test it, everybody has vulnerabilities. It's like, can I be breached is, is really the question that you and should what's ask. The what's the impact? Yeah, and what's the impact, what's, right? And then, so. yeah, because like a lot of, like I talked about this last week with, um, I was telling you that I got to present with Ed Scotus um, yeah. and I was talking with him about it and it's like, it's like, okay, I learned that downtime is, is a really big thing. Um, and so it, it really shifted my mind as to like, okay, well, when I consume a red team service, or a testing penetration testing service or an AppSec service, that like that has never been included in the scope of those tests, right? Like, can you can you bring me down somehow? Um, it's always been like domain admin or you know like you know can I leak some user data? And those things are important, right? But if you're honest with yourself as a business, you know like what is what is the the material impact of leaking user data? 
it is bad for your brand. You yep. may have to buy them credit monitoring. Most of the time, those passwords are hashed. So the attackers aren't getting passwords anymore. Um, they're getting email addresses, which everybody's email address is everywhere anyway. Yeah, um, it's, it's, we, we, it's, yeah. it's literally public information. Yeah, it's like it's you like almost public information, right? If you cannot guess yeah. an email address of a person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The only case it comes up with where you have like celebrities, right? Um, yeah. Where uh, celebrities are people of interest that... Um, you know, are trying to protect their identity, which it is important, but, right? But, I mean, but you're assuming yeah. celebrities are going to be using anonymous type mm -hmm. of email addresses that yeah. literally, because I mean, I, there's there's a bunch of email addresses that I use, which are basically yeah. completely randomized yeah. that have yeah. no association to my name or to yeah. references. So, and those yeah. are ones, you, you know, it, it's, it's how to, to separate yourself from basically communications. Yep. So you're assuming yeah. that celebrities would have something similar set up. Yep. Uh, and at those, absolutely, yeah. when those email addresses that are you know, set up to be, um, let's say, you know, only limited to a certain contact lists. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the ones that can they can cause harm yeah. and and uh, sometimes even stalking, especially yeah. for celebrities. Yeah. That that becomes the the big issue. The big issue, yeah. But I mean that that stuff is, I mean, to a business as far as like mm -hmm. loss and material loss goes, it pales in comparison to like you know someone, you know, finding out that they could take you offline and you none of your service mailing. So at Ubisoft, we had we had many many games um, somewhere mm -hmm. between the you know like. I think like 40 to 60 range. Uh, and mm -hmm. so every one of those is a product. They're all running their own stack. And when one of them goes down for technical reasons or for security reasons, that's millions of dollars lost because gamers are not consuming your product. They're not purchasing your uh, microtransactions. It's mm -hmm. like, uh, it's very similar to what's going on right now in, in Vegas, right? So yeah. right now, Las Vegas, MGM yeah, is under yeah, attack. The casinos, the, the, yeah. literally, the casinos are, are basically can't, yeah. can't accept uh, online yeah. transactions at the moment. Yep. I was telling... People, um, people couldn't get into the rooms or, as yeah. well, and they were handing yeah. physical keys. <laughs> yeah, I was telling somebody, they're like, they're like, how big of a deal is that? And I was like, well, casinos, on average, bring in $1.3 billion a day just from the gaming floor. So if, the, if all the gaming floor is down and rooms are affected and all this stuff is affected so that's that's you could say it's about 1.1.3 1. 1. a day plus the ip loss plus the pr loss plus the recovery cost um plus if they decide to play the ransom i mean they're they may be looking at like a you know close to two billion dollar loss like uh yeah. and that is and, and, and that'll and, probably and be that, the worst pains yeah i mean talking about that one, one that's per day the, per day how, how yeah. long, how long, yeah. how long is it gonna last yeah <laughs> um, the, you know, you, yeah. I, I just mean my my wishes are with the team you know because mm. it's such a stressful environment yeah. You know? yeah and the, the community can be harsh and sometimes quick to jump and, and yeah. you know, blame yeah um i, I can only be sympathetic because going oh, yeah. through instant response yeah uh, the stress that that team must be going oh. under it can, is immense it's uh, it's so stressful we especially yeah. when you put such a, a, a a cost of the business yeah. on top of it. Yeah. When you know that the business is suffering, yeah. um, that even puts a, a, a tremendous pressure on the team yeah. as well. And you know, it's, it's interesting because I know, I mean, I haven't spent an extensive amount of time, but I know the security leader for that specific issue that's going on right now. And he's trying to do everything right. Like his, yeah. his plan is sound, his, uh, you know, like they have been doing pretty advanced security assessment to try to get all their stuff shored up and, wanted to be at the forefront of kind of like assessment and bug bounty and all this stuff and still got ransomware. Um, you can so do all the right things. You can do all the right things. One, yeah. one area of, yeah. you know, lack of, ins lack of oversight, lack of transparency. And a lot of times it's sometimes through supply chain yeah. Um, yeah. that a lot of it comes through. Sometimes it's through basically, you know, hybrid cloud where yeah. you've got your visibility in one area, but you're not seeing it through a lot of API security and stuff is you know, yeah. we, right now it's, yeah, it's, you can do all the right things and it just takes one area that the yep. attackers can find yep. uh, yeah. that basically yeah. they exploit. So yeah. one, one yeah. important topic you brought up as well that, that brought, you know, I had, I had the same, you know, for many years, I also had the same view that security was about enforcing and, and pushing, mm -hmm. but I did, you know, many years ago, um, I, one of the, uh, basically, uh, departments I was responsible for was the ambulance service. Mm -hmm. And in the ambulance service, that actually taught me a very valuable lesson. Um, and it was very early in my career. It was uh, something, one of the first uh, uh, organizations I worked for. And it was very early because my metrics that I had for the system was aligned to the metrics that the business had uh, in order to the service that they had to provide. Yeah. And yeah. when you align that, that's one of the things is that when you look at a service, as you're talking about, you, you get a service and that service is worth X amount to the business. 
mm-hmm. when that service is running, you have an impact. Yeah. And one of my metrics that I had for the, I, at that time, I was responsible for the IT infrastructure and security. Um, and I had to align my metrics to the business metrics. And that was actually the SLA that ambulances needed to get to actually victims of either, you know, car traffic uh, yeah. accidents or, uh, you know, health issues and stuff like yep. that. So I had an SLA. My SLA basically was 23 minutes. And if I went beyond that SLA, people died. And that was a big realization. When you're in that situation, yeah. Yeah. you start kind of realizing um, that, you know, the importance of IT, the importance of yeah. systems being available. Yeah. And when hospitals even today are getting attacks, yep. you start realizing that has a, a, an escalating impact yeah. that those SLAs are, you know, get under serious strain. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that, you know, people's lives are at the end of it. Yeah. Pe- people who work for those types of services, uh, mm-hmm. I, ha- I have a buddy who's former Microsoft. Yep. And he's like, he, he used to run the SOC there, like, like global SOC and uh, MSRC. And he was like, yeah, it's a, just a different kind of stress when you know that your operating system is running on planes. And if your operating system messes up, things go wrong on a plane or a vehicle or, you know, um, and, it, and, you know, no wonder so many InfoSec people burn out, right? Because it's just, there's a high amount of existential stress. And there's also a high amount of um like on like on keyboard hours stress and Mm -hmm. um it is it is amazing um how how the mental load for this job how high it is sometimes and i'm not saying that other you know anything else you know is like any better but like i do know that some days uh you know my wife talks about the mental load for moms um and how you know like running the household is an is really an unglorified position Um, but, but there is this giant mental load associated to it. And so we talk about it all the time as like, you know, like, what can we do for, you know, you, you know, that we can make sure that like we, your mental load is sustainable. And, and it's the same thing for InfoSec people too, right? Like socks and, um, and even, you know, even assessors too, like you have a mountain of assessments you need to finish. You have to make sure that things get remediated, at least as an internal person, you know, and yeah. So, um, uh, my, my heart goes out. Yeah. To anybody going through a breach. Those are the, you know. I think every time I think about my, you know, I've been asked a lot of times, you know, what was my most stressful moment ever in my career? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I always go back to, it was actually, it was Y2K, but it was not the reasons of ah, Y2K. Okay. <laughs> so, All right. All right. So it was actually the preparation for Y2K. Ah, um, okay. All right. So, yeah. What happened at that time was that, uh, cause I had this SLA I had 23 minutes, 23 minutes mm-hmm. was always kind of keep systems and services running. Okay. Right. Um, and that was for, for emergency, uh, you know, phone, uh, the phone, you know, and then that got rid of to police, fire and uh, ambulance and rescue. Got it. And okay. the, the preparation was that we were basically connected directly to the, the, the mains. Okay. Electricity. Right. okay. And in preparation for Y2K, we were worried that it was going to be this blackout. Completely yeah. electricity yeah, yeah. fade. I remember everything yeah. just went down. So, yep. and I remember going around with the floppy disk, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> updating, just, updating, ah, updating yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. all the machines. Yeah, it was like that was me with two floppy disks and you yeah, know, synchronizing all the machines. Two floppy disks in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> I, still, I literally still have it somewhere. Um, and the pro- but the thing was the preparation was that we, uh, in order to prepare for the potential electricity blackout, mm-hmm. that we had to change over to basically generators. Okay, and that meant basically the electricity. Uh, so we had the mains phases and then the generator phases. Okay. So what I had to do in this, the critical systems was basically our mainframes that okay. we had that was basically, you know, the for the ambulances to know what addresses to go to, where the, you know, the patients and also was the uh, the routing and logistics and all of that stuff. Yeah. And what basically we chose a time of the week where it was the least busy, uh, mm-hmm. lowest uh, impact, of course, not Friday night or Saturday because they yeah, were yeah. always the busiest yeah. times of the week. Yeah, for sure. Let's try to choose the, the, the minimum impact. And we powered down the servers. We unplugged all of the plugs from the mains, put them into the uh, where the actually uh, uh, the generator uh, supply was, mm-hmm. um, and the phases, and basically powered everything back up. And everything didn't come back up as expected. Oh. And that was the most stressful moment of my career was watching oh, yeah. the clock of the SLA exceed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you yep. didn't know if your services you didn't know if it was going to work. Yeah. And that was yeah. that was always the impact is when you start realizing you know when you can tie it back to the impact and you make those relations. I think that changes our view a lot of times. Even um, in recent times, it was back in 2016. I did. It was actually that was another changing moment. I did a pen test of PowerStation. Mm-hmm. And it was the uh, CEO and CFO basically had changed my whole view because I, I, at that point in time, I actually thought my, my job was cybersecurity. 
Mm-hmm. And that was a, yeah. a moment in my career where I started realizing that's my skill. Yeah. And my yep. job is is to reduce the risk. Yes. <laughs> and, the impact yeah, yeah. and the help yeah. organization become resilient. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I think to your point that you know that you're bringing you brought up earlier. I think it's a point in re- time to realize is that um, when you put yourself in that other position where you're defending and where you're in a, a leadership role, how we prioritize things and see things uh, drastically changes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think that's something that we all have to get into, especially those who've been security for a long time. We had to start realizing that. Uh, so it, it's not security first. Mm-hmm. Security is an important element of it, but it yep. has to. It supports something else. Yeah. And we have to make sure we understand what that what, what that aligns to. We can no longer yep. work in a silo. We have no, to find ways to break those down. It is. It is so common to work with an you know an an established organization. Mm-hmm. I would say, but um, you know they do have this view of security, and the security group has this view of themselves that they're the they're the police right inside of this organization right they're there to you know admonish and and punish and enforce um, enforce yeah yeah. (laughs) and 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 it's it's our rules of the highway yeah yeah yeah, punish those who who who, who breach the rules (laughs) yeah and and that is not i mean that that's a model that has proven to not work except for maybe in a handful of organizations that are very strictly regulated Um, But for most software development and and organizations building products, it just, it doesn't work. Um, And so we are going through, I would say, you know, the inflection point of, of modernizing that with DevSecOps Mm -hmm. and, uh, and more and more security programs that are built around, you know, visible metrics, including Mm -hmm. development, um, you know, security teams acting more transparently, which, you know, we call purple teaming in a lot of forms security assessment being a cooperative, um, you know, endeavor, Mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure that we take care of our employees at a deeper level, you know, um, you know, with breaks and, you know, training and, you know, giving them opportunity opportunity Mm -hmm. for innovation. And so I see a lot of good things happening, but it's still going to take like, I think another five, 10 years until we get to the next stage of our evolution. It's people like yourself that really set that, you know, sets that kind of, let's say, you know, that cultural trends, you know, that change and and, and, and being those role models to be able to, to, to show how how it's possible. Can you talk a little bit about your transition from, you know, the hacker world into the scissor world? Because I I definitely want the audience, because a lot of the audience, you know, they are either getting in the hack and they want to see their career paths Mm -hmm. and they want to understand what's the possibilities. Yeah. So how was that transition for you? What was some of the, you know, the, the key defining moments? So I went from being a regular pen tester um, to um, playing in a CTF at DEF CON and Black Hat um, with Daniel Meisler. And <laughs> we played, uh, <laughs> we played in a CTF together and he was like, he was like, Hey, you're pretty legit. Why don't you come and work for me at, um, at HP? I'm building a new professional services gig there. So uh, we built out a small group inside of HP called Shadow Labs, and we weren't really allowed to do that. Like HP was not happy that we built a sub brand, but we mm-hmm. were competing at that time with um, teams like, you know, the leg- most legit back then was Nick Nick Prococo at Spider Labs. Mm-hmm. Um, that was probably one of the most legit pen tests and and kind of red teamy um, type organizations at that time. And so we we built Shadow Labs inside of HP, and it was really great. So my idol during that whole time was Dan Kaminsky. Um, director of penetration testing. At that time, it was IOActive, and oh, yeah, IOActive. Yeah. Jennifer, Jennifer Sunshine. Yes. Yep, Jennifer Sunshine. <laughs> it's the best, the best people. Yeah, um, and so you know that that was my goal was to get to that. And so I worked my butt off on that team. I um, I developed leadership skills that I really didn't have before. I was able to manage a team. I was able to build a methodology and some products. I did all the above, um, and eventually got promoted into the title I wanted. Um, which was director of penetration testing, and Dan and I oversaw, you know, over 120 different um, testers of, of different kinds: mobile, dynamic assessment, et cetera, et cetera. So that gave me a lot of management experience, and it for, gave me my first exposure to high-level management and an executive uh, level at HP. So that was um, that was cool. Um, did that, and then um, in the moonlighting kind of time. I was doing bug bounty because I wanted to keep my technical skill still up there. I I, I have this view that I can never, I, I don't feel like I can genuinely advise someone unless I know kind of what's going on in you know the real world. And so, um, so I wanted to keep my technical skill up. And so I was doing bug bounty, and this was when Bug Crowd was launched, and I knew Casey, um, who launched Bug Crowd, 
and he was like he was like hey i'm starting this new thing do you want to hack on a site and you get paid if you find bugs that was literally the email and i was like uh yeah that sounds great do i need to sign like a contract you know because back in the day you would have to have like a, oh, a full yeah, an nda full contract. he's like he's like no i'm just going to send you an email with the site and then when you find something you go to this survey monkey link and you put finding in there and i was like okay like you know like and so did it i started doing it and it was the first few bounties at bug crowd and uh ended up you know um being number one on their leaderboard for a couple of years and I'm still, you know, very highly ranked. I think I'm 59th over all time overall on Bug Crowd. So, um, so through that, at some point they were, you know, like I had many conversations with Casey and and back in the day, back in the day it was Jay Cran who was leading operations and they were like, come, come work for Bug Crowd. Um, we need someone to lead the operations team. Went over there, um, led that operations. He's one of the best places I've ever worked. Uh, I've had the luck to have fantastic teams everywhere I've been. Casey's I, awesome. So it's, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's yeah. such such a uh, idle and mental yeah. these days. Uh, yeah, these Casey's days. Casey's amazing. Uh, you know, I worked with Jay Cran too. He's one of the best. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jonathan Cran, everybody calls him Jay Cran. Um, and so uh, I ended up there transitioning from uh, operations director into um, VP of trust and security, which was another foray into executive land um, because I could present and I could break down technical topics to non-technical people. That's always been the superpower. Do you think it, the it superpower... Is, it is, that is the key, is yeah. being able to translate things yeah. into uh, everyday yeah. language. <laughs> if you think the superpower is knowing <laughs> You know, is knowing all your your tool, your hacker tools and your TTPs and stuff. It is not the superpower Find, is being yeah. able to write, explain, and present. <laughs> yeah. so. Finding zero days not the superpower, but actually being able to explain it yeah, to people exactly. every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I went there, and I, you know, you get into the fire there because Art Coviello was on that board. I mean, there were some hardcore people on that board. Um, and you had to come ready and present and um and so that was my first exposure to like a silicon valley like kind of aggressive funding board for a startup <laughs> and um that was really interesting and all of my superpowers that i had developed up to that point worked really well um and you know i helped a little bit starting bug crowds internal security programs but that was taken over by another team eventually i helped bring on researchers and stuff and then I left there to go to Ubisoft, and that was my first breakout big company. I mean, that was mm -hmm. 22,000 employees. Um, and, and the way I got that job is I, I had had like titles that were um, that were ready to go up, right? So like director of operations, manager of operations, those titles, you know, um, those titles are ready to graduate to CISO land if if you want to work in strategy and you know what the role is, right? Um, and so when I went in for my interview for Ubisoft. Um, you know, I used my hacker hat a little bit. I did I did attack surface management and recon on Ubisoft. And then what I did is I built a presentation for them and I said, this is probably what I think you're facing right now. You have mm -hmm. these sections of your business that are being attacked constantly. You have these games which are being trying which are being trying to be cheated. You have uh, internal player toxicity and you know X issues. You have this is your attack surface, everything I can see of it. Um, and then I actually found a bug during the recon. I had found that a couple of their developers had put passwords on GitHub and I, I, I disclosed that to them before they even had a bug bounty. And then I went to the office in, um, in Montreal and I presented, um, I presented to them, this is how it's structured, uh, you know, program. I said, first of all, it doesn't seem like you have visibility over everything you have. You're acquiring and being a production studio for all of these places, you know, like I'm sure the acquisitions are difficult you know, you're not getting all the assets offline and you're getting hit on these assets. Mm -hmm. And then I talked about, um, you know, building an external asset management program, building a vulnerability management program that supports all of those, how to prioritize, you know, different things to defend against different types of attacks that they probably face. I'd had some game hacking experience before I talked a little bit about mm -hmm. that. And I was the only candidate who came in with a technical minded plan, um, even though, when I got there, it didn't match reality, right? I didn't have any idea what their internal security program was. They were so impressed with the fact that I made a plan for them that they hired me. And that was that was how I got into Ubisoft. And then I had to learn what the real was. And I was like 50% right. I wasn't 100% right, but I was like 50% right. And but, but, we worked... but, but you're looking at it from the outside. Yeah, I mean, exactly. What's, what's, yeah, it, yeah, it's a whole, yeah. um, you know, to, to doing the reconnaissance and doing, you know, that whole yeah. assessment, you're looking from the outside. Of course, exactly. when you get inside, you start seeing... You know yeah. the organizational structure and, and process within, yeah. but that's pretty impressive yeah. to, 
yeah. to 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 look at it from already from that perspective and show them yeah. that even without you know having the internal knowledge that you came up with a strategy and a plan yeah. Uh, yeah. that really resonated with the with the team. Yeah, yeah, and then I went there and that was you know that was my first breakout role and um, really exposed me to big like big complex leadership uh, at a big company because there's politics. There's many different business units. It was multinational. You have to deal with multiple compliances. You have a huge team. So there's, you know, there's lots of like, you know, interpersonal stuff going on. Um, you have dedicated purchasing and HR, um, you know, sure. whereas any company, procurement, yeah, legal. Yeah, procurement, <laughs> legal uh, you're dealing with DPOs and CFOs and you're dealing with, you know, the CEO of a multinational company. So it was I a great experience. The, all the different levels of compliance as well. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. So. so it was a it was a great experience. I had a great team there. Mm -hmm. What I realized there is that actually I didn't want to be the big business CISO. Um, I missed the the more kind of startup y CISO, and I missed testing yeah. a lot. Um, but I learned a lot of valuable lessons staying in that role for a while, and um, so I went back to where I am now. Um, I had been moonlighting for uh, a friend of mine's business, Butterbot for years, like 10 years and doing pen tests for him. And then when I left, he was like, come over here and lead the offensive side um, that we're gonna move into the enterprise. Cause they've been doing government DOD pen testing for mm -hmm. a long time. So now we have moved into the enterprise world and are doing red teaming. So I developed strategy for our internal security program. And I also develop our methodology for uh, red teaming and uh, hire engineers and, do a little bit of hacking myself. So now I think I've got the perfect thing to make me happy. Whereas perfect I was ingredients just ingredients yeah, now of all of those. Yeah, all, all the all reasons. the ingredients now. Yeah. So um yeah, no, and that that was something I had to learn too, right? Like one thing I tell people like who are looking to make that graduation, right, is um understand what the job is, right? If you think that you're gonna go in and a lot of your time is going to be building security strategy, you're actually wrong. A lot of your time is as a CISO is spent um, basically, uh, in, for lack of a better word, it's politics, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. schmoozing things over between different business units. It's presenting your plan over and over and over again. So people know exactly what you're doing, exactly what they're investing in, explaining why you have priorities set the way they are, and then responding to like big, you know, it, it, you know, incidents and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. there's not a lot of time that you are actually drafting security strategy most of that gets brought to you by your directors and then you approve your sure peers, yeah, yeah. Your peers are going to be they're going to be navigating the ship what yeah, you're doing is yeah. making sure as that ship's been navigated yes is that yeah. you're not going into an storming, iceberg or, yeah. Waters <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, yeah or you know yeah you know off the yeah. coast of somalia where you're going to hit yeah, yeah. pirates so, yeah. you know yeah. that's ultimately our job is to, is yeah. to look and see what the least risk is yeah. and make sure that we we we, we, we navigate those you know, yeah. safer waters yeah. So, um, so just be aware of what you're getting into. There is differences between like medium sized business CISO work and large enterprise CISO work. It's much harder, large, large enterprise enterprise CISO work is much more stressful, much harder, um, because of your footprint. When you're being a CISO for a startup or a medium sized business, you still understand all your assets and all your security. You haven't ballooned out. You haven't made a lot of acquisitions yet. It's still very easy to go into a business like that and define a security policy and define a security program. Um, whereas if you go into a legacy, you know, kind of organization, it's much harder to retrofit security onto, you know, something like that. So it's, it's just important to have good resolve speed. if you're going to, yeah. yeah. Speed yeah. is much faster. Uh, yeah. You can yeah, do exactly. things much quicker for sure. Yeah. So sure. Jason, it's been awesome having you on and definitely yeah. for, you know, the audience, uh, you know, for people's looking for these different possibilities and paths yeah. um, that, uh, you know, they have all these opportunities ahead of them. I think that's yeah. really important is that you, know, that you don't, don't see uh, some, some people might get stuck in a rut, uh, but mm. it's really important to see that there is a lot of options and the industry is so broad that there's a yeah. lot of choices and a lot yeah. of ways to, to, to broaden your skill sets. Yeah. Um, you're definitely for the, you know, a lot of people in the industry, you're definitely a role model and a mentor for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, for, for many out there, if, if there's a way that people can reach out to you, if they're, they've got questions, you know, yep. about our advice, uh, yeah. are you willing to kind of, you know, let them uh, reach out? Oh, yeah. To yeah, absolutely. So I am um, at J Haddix, J H A D D I X on Twitter um, or on X now, I guess. And um, you can reach <laughs> out to me there and ask any questions that you want. You could DM me there. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my company, Butterbot. So we do adversarial emulation and simulation and red teaming. That's uh, B-U-D-D-O-B-O-T.com. And um, 
we're, we're building something special over there. And yeah, happy to answer any questions. Happy to come back and talk again. Loved it. It was a great conversation. Fantastic. So, Excellent. Yeah. Uh, we'll make sure they actually, we'll, we'll get all of those in the show notes as well for cool. sure. So that Very cool. makes it much easier for the audience. Nice. Uh, Jason, it's always great talking with you. Um, yes. Yeah. We should do this more often. That's, yeah, this, we should. This, yeah, is yeah. The fun, this is the fun part of my week. Uh, yeah, and it's that's great. great. Talking to you. Amazing uh, mentors and uh, those who really make a difference in the industry. Thanks, man. Um, I, you too, man. It's It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. So for everyone, uh, definitely, uh, Jason Haddix is a great person to follow. Make sure you, you know, you know, if you do have questions, you do, you know, have, you know, looking for advice in your own career uh, that you may be, you know, considering a scissor role, uh, definitely check out uh, Jason Haddix's work. It's, uh, you have an awesome workshop as well, by the way. Oh, thank um, you very so, much. Thank you. You too. <laughs> so definitely, yeah. if people's uh, interested, uh, take a look for the workshop as well. Yeah. Uh, so everyone, you know, this is the 401 Access Denied podcast. Definitely tune in every two weeks. We bring amazing guests, thought leadership, ideas, career advice, uh, all the things really to, to really make uh, you know, your career and path a, a great one. Uh, so again, thank you, everyone. Take care, stay safe, and see you next time.